Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and you join me in an absolute downpour on board the Golden Hind. In we go. Out up there. Oh this is most interesting. And I'm sheltered as well so I'm happy about that. <laughs> Riggers box. One of my ancestors, Peter Potkiss, he was a ship's rigger and he fell off the rigging at Dover Harbour and fell in the sea and drowned. They managed to get him out, his body out, but uh, yeah, he's buried in St Mary's churchyard in Dover. These are very low, even for a five foot six and a half, five foot seven person like myself. I'm going to bang my head a bit, I think. You say I'm being dripped off. This is most interesting, as a German would say. Sorry about that. <laughs> Just turning the uh, power saver off because it doesn't help with the filming. Right. That's the Tudor Rose on that one. This is a replica of the Golden Hind, of course, not the Golden Hind. But yeah, we are. Right, let's go below deck, shall we? Preferably without banging my head up. This umbrella is going to be a problem, I think. Yes. I'm really short, and even I'm crouched in, on this level. I should have left my umbrella with the lady at the uh, kiosk, but I didn't, so now I'm having problems. Should hopefully help a little bit. No, I'm going to have to remove the umbrella, I'm afraid, guys and girls, because I'm getting caught up on everything. Let's see. Molly is down here. Good job I got my hat on. Normally I take them off inside. A friend who's been here before knows my levels of clumsiness and advised me to keep my hat on. <laughs> Gunpowder. You know, in a battle, these places turned it literally into hell. Flying splinters of wood and whatnot. Then you'd have the ship's surgeon. Men that prided themselves on getting a limb off as quickly as possible. I'm just going to pause you a minute because my umbrella's coming undone, as it would. 
The barber surgeon just as I was talking about. The man that would take your limbs off as quickly as possible and pull bits of splinters of wood out of you. And these are his tools. Oh, good God. An amputation knife and saw. Oh, how horrid and frightful. Well, I've been looking forward to doing this one for a while, so I hope you guys and girls will all enjoy this as much as I will. I don't know how long it's going to be. If it's over 30 minutes, I'll just do it in one and put it on YouTube. Well, I could do part one and part two, do it on Facebook. Although the Facebook downloads are pretty crap lately, so I think we'll stick with YouTube. Abandoned's been, I was talking to Abandoned by message the other day and he said about how crap Facebook has become like, he's had uh, I was reading on his thing problems with people not seeing all his posts like he's got 21k or possibly more supporters so he should have a lot more likes on his things than that and people ain't seeing it because you get, you do, it does show you as a creator how many people have seen or viewed your things Now we shall go back on ourselves. Well, let's go and have a look at this room first and then go back on ourselves. Oh, no. stand up straight, man. Oh, right. this is brilliant. No, we're going to go back downstairs because I'm doing this all in the wrong order. So. Bear with me. No, it goes down down again. Oh, we're going down there now. This is most interesting. Well, I think so anyway. Alright. Now we should go back up the stairs. And then on to that bit I was going to do. What we got here. Which is thoroughly annoying me, if I'm brutally honest with you. Born on a farm in Tavistock in 1540, raised on the banks of the Rio Medway, Drake's first voyages to the Americas were as part of slave trading expeditions with his kinsmen, the Hawkins family. In 1568, Drake and Sir John Hawkins were attacked by the Spanish in San Juan de Ulla and made a narrow escape. Swearing vengeance, Drake began his career as a pirate. His successful raids on the Spanish colonies recommended him to Elizabeth I, who charged him with the task of furthering English interests of the Pacific coast and the Americas. The mission, which almost certainly included unwritten permission to plunder Spanish ships, 
and settlements was a closely guarded secret as not to inflame tensions between England and Spain. In 1577, Drake set sail from Plymouth with a small fleet of five ships. His flagship, the Pelican, was the only one to make it through the Straits of Magellan and raid the Pacific coast. It was renamed the Golden Hind in honour of its patron, Sir Christopher Hatton. Rich with Spanish silver and gold, Drake sailed west and became the first English person to circumnavigate the world. Returning home in 1580, where he was knighted aboard the Golden Hind at Deptford. Following his circumnavigation, Drake continued to play a key role in establishing England as a maritime power before he finally before finally succumbing to dynasty. No, sorry, sorry, <laughs> dysentery. He was buried at sea in a lead coffin. Dynasties, I ask you. What's this kid on? This is most interesting, as I keep saying. Oh, shit, nearly fell over. Jesus, see, I ain't even moving. Not even at sea, I'm moving, and I'm nearly going A over T. Right, guys and girls, we are going to go back upstairs, up this end, and then back onto the other part of the ship, hoping that the rain, of course, has stopped by now. in some months at sea. Scurvy. Let's talk about scurvy, shall we? Scurvy was the scourge of the British Navy and most navies are maritime people in those days and Britain being an island, we are maritime. It wasn't until the 1700s that they discovered that vitamin C helped <coughs> scurvy. Mid-deck, sorry. Mid-deck. Where we've been. Officers and firemen, they were navigating, they were dying as well in that room, right in the back room. Sorry, did you want to have a, a, a look at the toilet? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's a reason that we keep it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to find out. Oh my. Oh my. So they would just squat over the edge and oh. they would use a, a well-fed third toilet paper. Oh, nice. Throw that down Lovely. into the sea for the next day, though. Nice. <laughs> very nice. That's sharing is caring mentality. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Exactly. Yeah, you hear that, ladies and gents? That's your, your toilet in the olden days. Sorry. The animals, however, would just defecate yeah. on the floor. Yeah, I wouldn't so imagine them kind of hanging on there. No. So um, that's why it was such an important job and punishment to scrub the deck. And they would constantly be scrubbing the deck. And it's it's interesting because it's easy to assume that they were really dirty back then. But they had their own kind of form of hygiene. And they would um, the, Yeah, they would the, try and keep clean yeah. as best yeah. as they could. And, yes. and as healthy as they could. Exactly. And, yeah. and they would definitely take the mick out of other ships. If they climbed on board... They would often criticise the Spanish ships that they were raiding from for being really dirty really? environments. I've read so. that, yeah. Oh, yeah okay. I've read that, yeah, yeah. So it was definitely something that they It was a pride, pride yeah. 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 However, the in the larger picture, they only had about one set of clothes that they, they did not wash for a Ever, maybe, yeah. unless it was... Um, to, to modern day standards, yes. they were really kind of filthy. But yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, and they definitely weren't washing or brushing their teeth or anything. No. Like that. So, it wasn't the cleanest environment no, to live no. in. It must have smelled However, very right. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Uh, quite a large portion of the, the sailors that come on the trip make it make it back alive considering oh, okay mm. um so there were 80 crew members on board they did leave with a fleet of five ships and this was the only one to go all the way around the world two of the ships were broken down um 
not even halfway into the voyage, I would say a quarter or a third of the way into the voyage to um, repair the larger ships. So oh, that okay. means that those crew members would have been taken on all three ships. One of the ships turns around at one point in the voyage when they get hit by a terrible storm and they're separated. It turns around and goes home. So yeah. all of the crew members that were on that section of the voyage return alive. Um, one of the ships unfortunately sinks which probably means about a third of the crew of 160 people are, are dying. You perished and mm. lost at sea. Yes. Um, and then aside from all of those people, there were definitely a couple of sailors who were dying from either scurvy or dysentery or other, other sea-related yeah. diseases. Yeah. But, but out of the 80 people that leave on this ship, um, not including the potential Potentially Extras, more that yeah. came on board from the supplies. Fifty-six managed to make it back alive, which is quite a large. Yeah. thing. we've gone for three years, so. Yeah. And high, there was fighting and other things involved in that. So yeah. through that three exactly. years' time, that's not bad going. Yeah. You think of the adventure for someone back then, who, someone who hadn't travelled very <laughs> yeah. far. What an adventure! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, mind your head. Are you okay? Oh uh, yeah. It's okay. <laughs> I uh, bang my head all the time. I've been working here for about six months now, and it's still, I haven't gotten used to it yet. I still bang my head all the time. I'm quite short, so it's rare for me to bang my head, so it's a novelty for me. To, so, well, thanks very much no for the extra lesson. Thank, thank you. Sorry, thank you. And the rain has stopped now, and we're quiet right here. Now we're going to be going into the captain's cabin from that. And we had a, a brilliant history lesson from that young lady there. Got to see the poop deck, which people don't always get to see. So, there we are, guys and girls. This is the privilege of doing London Lookery. Sorry, thanks. Here we go. I don't know if this is the captain's cabin or what. We shall find out, though, I'm quite sure. And that is where we were down there. I could have come up those stairs, but I wanted to see the upper mid deck. The armory we're in at the moment. Weapons storage and the sleeping quarters for officers and gentlemen. The ship was also steered from here using a whip staff. The capstan in the centre was primarily used for raising the anchor. Well, we've had a good day today at London Lucary and um, Church of St Magnus the Martyr. <laughs> Bearing in mind the momentous times we live in, we've heard the curfew bell of the tower being rung for Her Majesty, which is not always done. Sorry if it's a bit dark, guys and girls, but I don't know. this is the life of a 16th or 17th century sailor. Now this must be the captain's captain's quarters or something like that. Cause this is quite ouch, that hurt. This is quite a fancy one. Sorry, that's why it was doing that 
this. There was a little thing that came on with a sunshine thing on it. I have no idea what it means or what it does, but it advised me to press it, and here it did. Here, look, Francis Drake, FD. It, it advised me to press the little sun thing, and press the little sun thing, look, did, and here we are. Now, that's the rest is history, as they say. The great cabin. A captain used, a cabin used by officers and gentlemen to socialise, work, eat and drink. The ship's gallery can be accessed through the doors on both sides. I'm going to get a decent view from here now. Well, there is the Thames. The scaffolding is up because there have been some repairs done on this. A pirate ship with CCTV. How novel. Now we can see the weaponry a bit better now. The sunshine thing has uh, done whatever it did. <laughs> Those small things there are grenades, believe it or not. You'd like them and throw them on board the deck of your enemy ship and blow them clean away. part of the ship now. that these curators and people that run these places have is brilliant. We just worship sharing the spoils. Down on the cramped lower decks. Oh, these are good. Oh, look. Yeah. Yeah. I like this. We're in St. Catherine's Wolf, by the way, which is a wolf that is an ancient rite of the parish of St. Mary at Overy. The parishioners had the right to birth their ships or boats here for free. And now this amazing replica of the Golden Hind lives here. And I'm quite pleased about that. The half deck. Prior memory by high-ranking officers and gentlemen. The platform to meet, navigate, oversee the work. Oversee the work by uh, taking place on the main deck. The hatch allowed for the communication between upper decks and the persons steering the ship below.
and we are here at the captain's cabin. So that would be where the gentlemen would go, up there. The half deck, up there. And this, my little poppets, is the captain's cabin. The only private quarters on the ship, Francis Drake shared a cabin like this with his brother and used it to write, paint, read and navigate. <clears throat> the old Thames side in there. And there we can see St Paul's. This is most good. I thought this deck was going to be really slippery, but I don't know whether they've put an anti-slip thing or some treatment on it to stop it from being like that, but I've not slipped over once. Which is rather refreshing for me. Right. Guys and girls, I am going to pause you now because there is a little girl below, and you know me, I don't like filming kids without the consent. We've seen the whole inside of the ship. These pegs here for pegging the ropes on and off to. Uh, we're going to pause you for a moment and then we are going to see the outside of the ship and yeah, be bare paying for a minute, you get me? That's amazing, isn't it? Did you hear that? So, a little bit off, but yeah. A little bit off, but it's funny that they sponsored like the entire building yeah. for that club, um, and they never even there. <laughs> yeah. So they, they then go across the Pacific Ocean, and they land at, in, in modern day Indonesia, what they consider to be the Spice Islands, but for the sake of convenience, because the map is very squished, I'm just going to prop them up next to the Philippines. And whilst they're here, they meet a very powerful called the Sultan of Turne and they flatter this king with all of their treasure and they promise him that the queen is going to send him a fleet that's going to look after him and in exchange he gives them a lot of spices at this period of history one pot of cloves or one pot of pepper is going to be worth its weight in gold in Europe because the spices are very valuable and they stay the way of course that fleet never comes yeah, it was like, yeah we promise you everything and Um, but we do know that the Queen takes £10,000 from her personal finances during her 
strength takes 10,000 pounds. For his personal finances, they store 264,000 pounds worth of goods in the Tower of London with, for safeguarding in case the Spanish come and invade them because they have made them very angry on this trip. Yeah. And we do know that later on in history, they do come to invade England, and this is known as the Spanish Armada. Also, uh, kind of strategized by Francis Drake, even though they were mainly defeated due to the weather conditions. People in this country considered him to be a, a national hero for a very long time because he came back with a fortune, he made the Spanish go away when they came to invade them. Um, and using all of this money that they put into the Tower of London, they're able to clear some of their debts as well. So he makes the Queen and the country very happy. Mm. 400, as for the, the rest of the crew, 4,000 pounds is shared amongst them according to your ranking. So um, if you're a common crew, you only walk away with a fair wage, unfortunately. Um, some things never, never change. Uh, what this means in today's currency, because this is back in 1580, is that approximately 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds is stored on this ship. Wow. And it's a very small ship, so that, that's, that's amazing. quite a lot of, yeah, uh, that is of, amazing. of money. Um, and the original ship is then docked up at the Deptford Dry Docks, which is also in London, in South London, where it lives as a museum for the rest of its life, which is about 50 years after the voyage, until all of the timber eventually rots away, and then they make it into a chair, and they put it in the Maritime Museum. And we have this replica, or this reconstruction instead. Um, Whilst it was a museum, much like this one is today, people will come from all over England to come and visit the first English ship that's gone all the way around the world. And to them, it would be like seeing a spaceship that's gone to the moon and come back because most people are not leaving their communities, let alone the country. So they wouldn't be able to imagine what lies outside of England. Um, so it was a very val valued um, national and historic site. And uh, now the museum has two histories in a sense because it's, it's got the history of, of that circumnavigation and then also the circumnavigation that it did for the 400th anniversary of the voyage um, where it went around the world and it stopped, by, it stopped by many places across the world and probably thousands of people have gone to, to visit it as well in the 70s and the 80s. So, that's the story of the Golden Hind. That's brilliant. Thank you Thanks very much. Yeah, it's very well told. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. When was this one constructed? So this one was constructed in the 70s and it circumnavigated in the late 70s and the 80s. Ah, brilliant. Um, I was going to ask next. But it's done more nautical miles than the original ship because I think it's done more than one circumnavigation. So, it's done 110,000 nautical miles at sea. Um, the original one was gone for three years. If, if it was a straight circumnavigation, it would probably be less. Um, but this one was this one was on the sea for quite a long time, mm -hmm. near 10 years before it was brought up over here where it will retire probably yeah, like a decommissioned kind of thing yeah that's brilliant thanks very much for that thank you thank you thanks very much well that was brilliantly told wasn't it and every bit of that completely accurate drake made the english very rich and the queen very pleased and the spanish very angry the spanish detested drake but they also feared him and they called him el draco the dragon there we are. Thanks very much. Take care. Wish you well. Thanks. Thanks very much, brilliant, thank you, thanks very much. Well, I must say, I enjoyed that a lot. And while we're here, I will just show you quickly 
the completely unlucky and screwed up story of the Overs family. Mary Avery. Basically, the old man, Eve, was fat off and did one of the big boat companies that would ferry people over the river in those days. And he was a notorious miser anyway. To save some money, he pretended to die. So thinking that his servants and family wouldn't feast and whatnot. Anyway, they disliked him so much that when he died, they started celebrating. But he didn't actually die, he pretended to be dead. So once he saw him celebrating, he jumped up with rage. And uh, one of the servants, thinking it was the devil, the devil had possessed him, struck his brains out. Um, his daughter sent for a fiancé, whatever you want to call him, and uh, him thinking, oh wow, I'm in for a great big inheritance, got on his horse and rode quickly, fell off, broke his neck. The Mary, or Mary Overs, after her grief, was so grief-stricken that she basically founded the Church of St Mary over it, which then became Southwark Cathedral, which is over there. And we're going to have a wee look at the outside of the ship now. This will be a YouTube jobby, this one, because it's more than half an hour long. As I say, it pulls to read if you want to read it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Golden Hind. Hope you all enjoyed that. If you did, you know what to do. Thanks very much for watching. Take care all.